those are all nine, ten pound bass that we caught in probably a half hour of fishing on uh, Lake Redunda was the name of the lake. If you ever go, I, I've never been back, but it was it was really uh, a great moment to remember. I mean, the minute you twitched that Zara spook out there in the middle of that big lake, a, a nine or ten pound bass would there was a school of big bass there working and you know that's all about bass fishing you know you it's more like hunting and fishing too many people stay in one spot i got a 15 minute rule 15 minutes i don't find it get a strike or mark them on my fish finder or just don't feel like the conditions are right there's too many other spots to fish <laughs> That's why you got a motor, mercury motor on the back of your boat. Retro bassin, kicking some ass and wearing rayon jackets. Thinking about Bill Dance, watching these fish prance through my Ray Ban glasses. Ain't nothing better than 40 year old lures coming off of Zepco 33. Bass boat making beer cans float, doing some trespassing. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassin. Welcome to Retro Bassin. We are downtown Fernandina Beach, just outside of the Amelia Angler. I am pretty excited about today's episode. It is a personal goal of mine to film as many local privately owned tackle shops as I can. And it's another goal to meet as many fishing legends as I can. Well, today I'm gonna knock two of those things off the list. We're gonna take a tour of the Amelia Angler Outfitters and also meet owner, charter captain, outdoor author, and fishing legend, Terry Lacoste. Hopefully you guys love this tour. I cannot wait to get in there and show you some of the old school artifacts on the wall and I'm sure we're going to get a story or two from Terry himself. So you started Amelia Angler Outfitters in 1978. Right. How did that come to be? Well I was uh, working at the golf shop and I was taking people bass fishing back then in Red Maple Lake and Lofton Creek and they built a convention center out there and a lot of people were coming to the resort uh, for meetings and recreation, golf, tennis, and they added fishing. <laughs> so uh, they gave me a store at the hotel, right at the beach club. My wife and I ran it, and we, we took care of all the group fishing charters and individuals. In fact, <clears throat> uh, that grew into a big business. We, we had that business from 78, 2012 I think and then I was down here doing a book sign and this store actually came open and they were tearing down the hotel Omni bought a million plantation and they tore the hotel down in my store they offered me another location at the hotel but it wasn't a good location and Don Shaw had this store available it used to be a little kids shop and I bought it <laughs> So this is the best move I've ever made because the marina is right there. We do still do the gr group charters, and I do them for the rich or whoever now, not just the Omni. I still do all their charters, but we've been doing that for almost 45 years, I guess. Yeah, sailing, sightseeing, dinner cruises, bass fishing, backwater fishing, uh, sightseeing, sailing. We do it all. <laughs> That bass was, uh, I was a PGA golf pro at the May Island Plantation. And uh, this, this golf pro missed the cut. He, he wasn't good enough for the tournament, the Jacksonville, Jack, uh, Jacksonville Open back then. So he was in the shop. I was a golf pro at the May Island Plantation. And uh, anyway, we started talking and we set up a fishing trip. We went down the St. John's River and anyway, we were catching bangalores. It was the springtime, so the bass were spawning. And uh, I cast a bangalore up close to uh, a cypress tree, and a big old boil and a big old bass took it and went straight down into the roots. 
and he snagged into the roots. And Jerry Hunter, the, the golf pro that was with me, dove out of the boat into the water, dove down into the cypress tree and unsnagged that bass. And that's how we caught that bass. That was 11 and a quarter pounds. Yeah. <laughs> what a story on that one. But all these bass have a story. Uh, <clears throat> There's Carl Wickstrom up there in the photo. Uh, we, we went to Bienville Plantation. Are you familiar with that, Chris? Bienville Plantation. Uh, it's the best place you can go bass fishing, period. We uh, went there and we were swimming a Gary Yamamoto uh, worm paddle tail. And the bass would come up and blow on it. Just cast it right out in the middle of the lake and just keep your rod tip up and it would buzz along the surface. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, we did so well, I, Roland Martin called me and I talk, he calls me every now and then. I've done nine shows with Roland. And anyway, we set up a trip and Roland Martin and I uh, went to uh, Bienville and we caught him up to 10 pounds. That's a photo of Roland. Martin up there uh, and that's my grandson Jace he's uh, fishing in uh, the high school Bassmasters right now and uh, they've done as well as second place on Lake Okeechobee they had like 24 pounds the biggest one was seven pounds I think uh, but all these ba all these bass have history you know uh, the one up here TD caught a 12-pound bass. I think it's that one way up there on the right, uh, Lake Okeechobee. And uh, <clears throat> Mary and I took him down there on vacation and we uh, set up this little uh, island of hydrilla and lily pads and sawgrass and we ran wild shiners under the weeds and T.D. had a strike and he set the hook and this 12-pound bass came up spit the hook. He sat there in the boat and cried. He was only 12 years old. He said, Dad, that's the biggest bass I've ever hooked. He says, I need to catch that bass. Well, we went back, had lunch. Mary went to the hotel. I said, let's go back fishing, T.D. And we went back to that same spot and T.D. caught that bass. That's that photo that I showed you earlier of the big bass. But the <clears throat> bass over here the nine pound bass is the biggest one, largest bass I ever caught in a Bassmaster tournament, the one on the, the wood there with the lily pads. I was fishing uh, with Orlando Wilson in Lake Eufaula up in a creek and uh, throwing small worms. They were spawning on a bar in a, a creek that fed uh, <coughs> Lake Eufaula. And uh, that's about it on the bass. We have Lofton Creek nearby that has some big bass. Uh, I think that one's 11 and a quarter that we caught in Lofton Creek, uh, not too far off the island. And there's a lot of lakes and ponds, like I mentioned, Johnson's Lake, right off the island where Trailer Park, there's some giant bass. I once hooked a 14, 15 pounder in there this time of year in the spawning season and lost it. But uh, yeah. Not a lot of people fish for bass here because it's all salt water. Yeah. But, you know, that's great memories and my favorite lure, I guess, for if I had to pick one lure is like a 10 inch, 11, 12 inch worm, <laughs> plastic worm. A lot of people are afraid to fish with a, a large plastic worm, but you can swim it, you can dead fish it, you know, throw it out there on the bed and just let it sit there or you can bump it along the bottom. But that's my go-to lure. Uh, I like a black drape is my favorite color with uh, uh, a twister tail, a man's, a big one. Uh, I guess the, the, my, I fished the Bassmasters one year and I placed in two of the tournaments and I was in the top 20 at the end of the year uh, but I almost won the Okeechobee tournament. The last day, I was fourth place at 300 fishermen, and the last day of the tournament, my partner 
We were catching them on a snagless alley. I was. My partner was fishing with other lures, but I was showing the snagless alley that I took the treble hook off and put a weedless hook in place of it so I could cast it in the hydrilla and lily pads and stuff. And I was kind of buzzing it, the snagless alley, and the bass would come up and roll on it, and they would miss it, and I would take a, a large plastic worm and throw it right back in that hole and catch them. So the last day I was, I had my limit and I was culling and my partner and I, it was hot, no wind. The bass had gone down deep in the weeds. We started flipping and we take turns flipping in these potholes. And he flipped in one pothole and caught a seven pounder and that would have won me the tournament. <laughs> if I would have flipped in that hole, he got my bass, what I say. But Roland Martin actually uh, won that tournament. And uh, he's a close friend of mine. He comes up here and fishes that uh, big tarpon up there on the wall. Roland Martin caught on the fishing show with me. And uh, we've had some big sea trout, redfish on top water. But Judy, his new wife, Judy, came up and fished with me one day. And we redfish. He had just been to Mexico catching bass on top water. And uh, we were throwing top water, and the bit redfish would come up and suck it in. And Judy says, "Now, Roland, a lot of people make a mistake. They set the hook too quick with a top water plug." He says, "You got to reel down and pause, and then set the hook." And as she was saying that, a big redfish pulled up on her top water plug, and she jerked it, and it came, the plug came back and hit Roland Martin in the head. <laughs> That was really funny. <laughs> and Judy told, uh, turned to the cameraman and said, now, now Judy, tell the, cam to tell the folks what, exactly how to set that hook with a redfish. <laughs> and these are all my uh, collecting lures yeah, see these. over a period of time. I've collected uh, several lures. I never throw them away. Uh, my favorite lure, I guess, over the years would be a zero spook. You know, uh, and as I mentioned, the Omni and the Island Plantation has a lake out there that we, yeah. my son has caught them up to 15 pounds in there. Yeah, and uh, my favorite technique is to go out there and th throw a zero spook, a black zero spook. And uh, that's the way to catch a big bass or a, a big plastic worm. It's all catch and release. I actually went out there as a, I was a director, I was a golf pro out there for five years and uh, this is my old golf bag if you can see it and I was sponsored by Wilson. Would you often have a travel rod in your golf bag? Ah uh, yes. Or, or do when you golf? Yeah you actually yeah I would bring a uh, rod with me but when I was at the golf shop I would um, have that rod and reel ready and at lunchtime I would go out to Walker's Creek and catch a couple of redfish and uh, the chef would cook them for the golfers here, <laughs> but <clears throat> anyway, that, that's how I got started in fishing in this area it was uh, working at the golf shop and the golf pro that I took was Roger Parker. I don't know if I mentioned his name. Uh, I don't, I haven't seen him in several years and that's actually the, this, this photo here is actually the big bass that we caught on the top water plug on a zero spook, it was just over 10 pounds. And that's, you can see the, the green in the background. Yeah. I noticed uh, a lot of trophies, what's your favorite one? Uh, probably uh, these two right here. This was uh, Redfish Cup in Coca Tree, Louisiana. It was on ESPN. My son and I won that uh, the last day. We caught them on zero spooks, believe it or not. Uh, that's how we caught the winning fish. And this is uh, the first place, uh, the Cabela's Championship in Jacksonville. That was a national redfish tour. You know, you have to qualify for it. And, and we won that tournament with uh, Johnson Spoons, casting the old three-quarter ounce Johnson Spoon. Yeah. What color? Gold, yeah, just an old gold. And TD and I have won like nine 
first place SKA Kingfish tournaments together. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, bass, redfish, kingfish tournaments. And I've been outdoor right of the year. All right, tell me about that picture up there. Is that you with the big stringer? Uh, yeah, that that's actually the one that uh, <clears throat> we, uh, Bob McNally and I went to Cuba a long, long time ago, probably 1980, I would say, uh, almost 50 years ago. And they would promote bringing the bass home from Cuba to eat them, but <clears throat> we brought them back and mounted them. Those are all nine, ten pound bass that we caught in probably a half hour of fishing on uh, Lake Redunda was the name of the lake. If you ever go, I, I've never been back, but it was it was really uh, a great moment to remember. I mean, so I've noticed I was watching some of your videos. So I noticed you do some red fishing right outside. And then I noticed you were up in Lofton Creek, which is right by my house. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So that's one where I'm curious to see. I, I, I went there once. I didn't do anything. So what was I doing wrong? You said you mentioned Shiner to me before. Yeah. Well, if you really want to catch big fish in there, Chris, Shiner fishing actually is the way to go. And you can catch them in that creek by taking some bread where you're fishing for bass along the grass line and just kind of throw some little pieces of bread out there. And after you do that, they sink slowly. They start coming into that chum line. And then you take a two, couple pieces of bread and you mush it in, in the water and you splat it right where you're throwing it. And then you take your cast net and toss about an eight foot cast net. And uh, once you catch your shiners, you put them in your live well, <clears throat> take a kale hook, one of these kale hooks. This is a little bit large, but I like this. It's in between a circle hook and a regular hook, but usually about a four-aught kale hook. And uh, hook them <coughs> right up through the mouth and use a float. Not a very big float, but uh, use a float. Looks like we're out of them now, but about a foot and a half, two feet, just under the surface so they swim around. And once a bass hits them, just let them swim, tighten the line up, and set the hook. Yeah, there's some, in fact, the best place in Lofton is called the Horseshoe. You know, once you put in off of the highway on 105, on the park, on the, the boat ramp right there, you, you go south, and it makes a turn, and there's a horseshoe right there, and that's the best spot. It's only like 300 yards from the boat ramp. Yeah. Wow. But it's all good. I mean, there's a lot of cypress trees, a lot of little feeder creeks. If you see a feeder creek come in, you know, on high tide, that's the key. High yeah. tide, because the fish will start moving in close to the shoreline. On low tide, they normally will go out in the river channel. But if you can find high tide about 10 o'clock in the morning, in the spring, when the water temperature starts warming up, that's a good time to be fishing there. The nice thing about fishing these rivers here, they're brackish, so you're likely to catch stripers and redfish. Yeah, you know, a lot of redfish. But uh, fishing around here is just really, if you're a fisherman, this is a place to live. <laughs> you can catch blue marlin, like you see, we got wahoo, shellfish, dolphin, kingfish is the biggest saltwater fish around here. They have several big kingfish tournaments throughout the year and uh, you catch them right along the beach or at the jetties or offshore and they get up to 50 pounds. It was just some big ones behind you. Yeah. For first place, Golden Isles. My son and Billy Burbank and I used to fish that. We Nobody chummed back then. They all trolled the drone spoons, and the big Rapalas, they trolled. And nobody live baited kingfish back then. And that tournament went out of uh, Brunswick, Georgia. So we ran down to Fernandina, anchored our boat uh, off the inlet, and started. First of all, we cast net Menhaden and put them in the cooler and some in the live well. And we'd chum with a dead Menhaden, create a chum slick. And then we'd float Menhaden back there. And those kings would skyrocket 
but uh, that's how we won. We've won it four times, I think. Anyway, the second day of the tournament was a two-day tournament. Every, everybody thought we were cheating because they were trolling and they catch the snakes, you know, eight pound, 10 pound, rarely a 20 pound plus. And we had 30, 35 pound kingfish that day. As you can see, they're pretty big. <clears throat> and Billy Burbank and I won that tournament. Anyway, uh, the next day they followed us, <laughs> the committee boat, and they saw how we were fishing and that, that was history. Everybody started doing the same thing. <laughs> but we still want it, you know, you have to, the tides are critical, you know, you can be 50 yards, 30 yards away from where those kingfish are, you know, setting up. It's critical to, we used to anchor and put a jug on the anchor line so when the big king hit and he ran, because we were fishing only 20 pound line, you know, 40 pound king, you know, you, you had to follow him. So we'd throw the anchor buoy over and it would keep us in the same spot. We could go back and, you know, anchor in the same spot. We'd chase it down and had a long gaff and we'd gaff and we'd come back and fish in the same spot. But we were always moving according to the tide, you know, closer away from the inlet, in the inlet, north jetties, south jetties. Um, it's like bass fishing, you know, you got to keep moving. But they're great fish, especially when they skyrocket. They'll come eight feet out of the water sometimes. Written, uh, this is a redfish book. And it's actually got a DVD in the back. Flora Sportsman. Uh, contracted me to do the books all surf fishing for redfish backwater habitat you know pulling your boat cast netting uh, fly fishing is very popular for redfish fly fishing is really with the eight weight seven weight six weight yeah rapalas the nice thing about redfish is they're very versatile they'll they'll take a any kind of lure you know, some are better than others, like little crankbaits, floating uh, baits like the Rapala, the Bangalore, Bagley, uh, yeah. And when you're fishing out there, you're fishing in a world of structure like oyster bars, and the tides are very critical. You know, you don't want to get stuck out there, so you watch the tides, the tides. Uh, actually predict when the fish are going to be biting too. And actually the power pole, John Oliverio, who's a close friend of mine, invented this power pole and he showed up on Mosquito Lagoon with a boat with a power pole and everybody says, you're crazy, that's not going to work. <laughs> and uh, well, about 45 years later, you know, he has created one of the best fishing instruments for boating accessories you can ever wish for. And now he's got that move electric trolling motor that I've got on my KMOS boat that's uh, really, really, really great. I mean, you can set it and program it to uh, go down a track, a course while you cast. It's got the anchor mode and it's very, very quiet. You can't even hear it. Uh, all about boats in the book, fishing boats, fly fishing again, lures. It really covers red fishing, um, A to Z. And then I have the kingfish book that I wrote for the Southern Kingfish Association. Um, how to how all about boat again, boat equipment, and uh, that's my granddaughter. <laughs> and that's. Uh, about a 45 pound king, a big one. And that's Jeff Dunbar, real close. And uh, actually, this gentleman here moved to May Island, him and Nancy, and I took them fishing in Lofton Creek. They didn't like fishing, they were new to fishing. All of a sudden, they bought a boat called the Fish Dancer, a small 22, 23 foot boat. They entered the Kingfish tournaments and they got hooked. Now they got like a 40-foot contender with triple mercuries on it. They've won kingfish tournament, and I got them 
got them all started in it. <laughs> One of my close friends, but again, this book is all about boats, equipment, live baiting, dead baiting, kingfish. Very popular. They get like the Jacksonville Kingfish Tournament at one time had a thousand boats into that tournament. It's every year in July. And they have the Nassau Sport Fishing Association right here in May Island that runs the annual uh, Fernandina Beach Kingfish Tournament. And uh, there's Roland on one of the fishing trips that I took him. And that's the downrigger that you put your light line on downriggers and slow troll live bait, ribbon fish, mullet. I kind of started that with Cannon a long time ago. I was the one that started live bait fishing with uh, downriggers for kingfish. So you're still running charters out of here, huh? Yes, sir. 81 years old, I'm still trying to stay young. <laughs> I've got a 28 foot Camus I got last year with a Mercury 400, and it gives me the versatile versatility of going offshore, fishing backwater. It draws about 14 inches of water, so uh, it's a great fishing boat. Yeah. Uh, Camos Earl Bentz. Yeah, him and I go back. When I was fishing the Bassmaster, I met him, and I ordered a boat, an old uh, Hydrosport bass boat like a 19, 20 foot, to fish the Bassmasters. And I went up there, they finished the boat, and he invited me for dinner. And uh, him and Jane uh, Bentz, and I had my check, and I was gonna give him the check, and he tore it up. <laughs> and he said, just see me in 12 months. So that's the kind of relationship I've had with Earl Bentz. And he's been here fish with me. I, I gotta say, he's probably one of my best friends, Earl Bentz. And I helped design some of the boats, you know. I, I did a thing, uh, I'm always trying to figure out how to catch more fish. So, well, things like fish stickers, I sold fish stickers through the magazines, reflectors that you stuck on the bottom of your boat and the sunlight goes down and it comes up and reflects on the fish or the fish see them. If it doesn't catch the fish, it catches the angler. <laughs> but I had Pogio, I had, uh, company called Fatso Polio. They have a, a paper um, a polio plant over here. Uh, NASA fertilizer they call it. And they had a big drum, big huge drum full of polio. When they closed down all that oil was in there and it eventually settled down and it was a concentrated polio. And when you took it out and mixed it a little bit with the regular polio and put it and, and then put it in a five gallon bucket with uh, fish pellets. You soaked it into the fish pellets and then you, you took a laundry bag with a little hole and you filled it up into the fish bag and you hung it over your gunnel in the water and it would attract the fish. The smell was, <laughs> you didn't want to get it on your hands. It was a terrible smell. <laughs> but it, I had that company and people would call us and we'd UPS it out five-gallon buckets. I had big five-gallon buckets of it. But we used all the pogey oil, and I can't do it anymore. But you can still buy menhaden oil at tackle shops, yeah. So if you buy menhaden oil, get some fish pellets, catfish pellets, put, them, put it about a quarter full in a five-gallon bucket and mix it with a little bit of pogey oil. And uh, next time you go fishing, hang it on your gunnel with your boat, whether you're crappie fishing or... Uh, fishing for redfish, it works best for kingfish, so that's what I found. So just don't spill it on your carpet. Don't fill it on uh, anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst stuff to have to clean. Oh, I love it. What's this picture, last thing? That's an old one. Yeah, that's uh, all the businessmen in Fernandina. And it looks like they caught all those fish, but they didn't. The, the shrimp boats... They, they would catch all those fish in their nets while they were shrimping, and they'd bring them in and pile them up on the dock. So one day, they, the shrimp boats, one of the captains called uh, downtown here. All the businessmen came down to see the big catcher. Those are redfish and 
black drum. So they set up that photo. But that's one of the most unique photos of Fernandina and Fishy. Uh, every year, people try to buy that photo from me. So I, I'm an old school guy. What's the most old school thing you still do? Sounds like you use a lot of the new equipment and boats. And what's the most old school technique or lore that you've kind of clung to all these years? Probably the Johnson Gold Spoon. <laughs> yeah, or the Zero Spook. Those two lures are still in my tackle box, you know. Uh, and spinner baits, you know. They've gone from the old Snagla Sally up to the chatter baits which a lot of red fishermen and bass fishermen are using now, the chatterbait. But they just kind of modernized the Zero Spook and Chug Bug. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the Zorro Spinnerbait, I've still got some of those in my, the old Zorro sp Spinnerbait. Uh, I love to fish with spinnerbaits. But my main, like I told you, if I had to fish with one lure, it would be a... 10, 12 inch black grape plastic worm with a curly tail. Like, there's something about a big bass thud, making that thud on the rod tip. You feel that thud, thud. And the anticipation of reeling down the line, moving slowly along the water. You, you get right down to the water and you set the hook and the drag starts working. <laughs> and then that big bass comes up and jumps. Yeah, that's probably the best experience I've had in fishing all my years is catching a big bass. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bass.